Hi everyone, it's Petra here from Petra Fisher Movement. I am super excited today to give you my top 10 tips for dealing with plantar fasciitis that you may never have heard before. Um, it's a really poorly understood condition out there in the medical world, and I'm hoping I can give you some insights into why it's poorly understood, why it's so confusing to try to figure out what's going on and what to do about it, and hopefully give you a great path forward. So let's start just by defining what we're talking about here. Plantar fasciitis is specifically when the tissues of your feet, when the muscles of your feet stop doing their job well, they outsource that job to the connective tissues of your feet, the plantar fascia, which aren't supposed to do the job of the muscles. And so those connective tissues become um, less high quality, they start to hurt, they start to break down. So it's when you get a breakdown of those connective tissues, and it'll normally show up as pain around the heel. Important point here, not all heel pain, or by any means all foot pain, is plantar fasciitis. It is often wrongly diagnosed. So that might be worth checking into um, if you're having a hard time dealing with yours. It might not even be plantar fasciitis. But I'm hoping that I can give you some clues and steps forward here uh, if that's what's going on for you. So without further ado, let's launch into my tips. So number one is that there is no one size fits all solution for plantar fasciitis. It's very unique. And that is one of the reasons that it's so confusing because what works for your Aunt Lou might not work for you. Very unique, expect to have to do some figuring out, some exploring, put your detective hat on, and the next few tips are gonna helpfully give you some clues about what you need to do for your own body. Number two, the reason it is so confusing is because plantar fasciitis at its heart is an overload issue. What that means is that the tissues of your feet are being given too much weight. They can't handle it, so they break. There's really three ways of addressing that. Number one is those tissues have to get stronger. Number two is so that the loads have to decrease so that you know they, they aren't um, as intense for the tissues themselves. And number three is a combination. You can strengthen the tissues and decrease the loads. And most people are gonna find that they uh, need to figure out which of those things is the one that's the key for them and which tissues they need to strengthen or which loads they need to change. So the other tips are gonna be all about that piece of the puzzle. All right, number three, let's talk footwear. Footwear is really important in plantar fasciitis. Footwear is probably why you have plantar fasciitis, because conventional footwear is incredibly weakening for our feet. And once you have super weak intrinsic and extrinsic foot muscles, then you're more liable to have an overload. So conventional shoes have been hurting us. What should we do about that once we have been hurt? That's the million dollar question and the answer is going to vary. Because what you could do is you could switch to what's called a barefoot shoe. A barefoot shoe is very minimal. It um, allows your foot to behave as though you were pretty close to barefoot. And I've got lots of resources on what that exactly means, but basically it's a thin sole and a wide toe box and no raised heel. And that can help some people because as soon as you switch to that shoe, you're gonna start strengthening your foot. But it can be terrible for some people because it might be an overload as well. Having to walk around with no sort of cushioning could be the overload that triggers worse plantar fasciitis. So that's why it's so confusing because maybe a minimal shoe's awesome and maybe it's a problem. You're gonna be somewhere on that spectrum. I recommend investing in a transitional pair of shoes, so something that has cushion, a wide toe box, and no raised heel as an interim step. Seeing how your feet react to that, doing some foot strengthening exercises, and maybe spending some time barefoot, see how your feet react, and then make your decision about how to move into a more barefoot style shoe. If your feet are feeling good with that sort of change in your footwear, then by all means explore it, but always have a backup pair of shoes in case it's too much for you. So footwear is really important. Eventually we're gonna wanna heal you and get you into some nice minimal shoes if you wanna have really lifelong foot health, but you don't necessarily have to do it all at once, and certainly, too minimal, too fast could be an overload that could be problematic. So that's where that no one size fits all thing happens, okay? So we kind of already talked about this. If your foot muscles are too weak, the obvious thing to do is strengthen them. So tip number four, strengthen your foot muscles. In particular, you wanna strengthen the muscles that lift and lower all your four little toes 
and help your toes stay straight as they lift and lower, so no clawing. You wanna make sure your big toe lifting and lowering muscles are super strong. You want your arch creation muscles to be super strong, especially if you're someone who's more on the flat-footed, pronated side. And you want the muscles that stretch between your calves and your feet to be super strong as well. So that's why you're gonna see a lot of calf raises in plantar fasciitis um, prescriptions, a lot of toe lifts, a lot of foot strengthening, is just to get those feet strong. If you want any of these exercises, by the way, my Free Your Feet program was designed with plantar fasciitis in mind. So it doesn't cover absolutely everything I'm gonna talk about today, but that's gonna give you a great foundation for foot strengthening work, and you can pick it up in the, um, uh, what are they called, the, the comments for this video, or you can uh, find it on my website or my Instagram as well. Okay, so foot strengthening. The next thing to think about is can your feet pronate and supinate, and what does that even mean? So when you walk, your feet should go through a cycle of what's called supination to push you forward. That's where your foot actually twists internally to itself to become rigid, and that pushes you. And then as you roll over your foot, it's supposed to absorb the shock and the weight of your body, and then it's supposed to come rigid again as you step forward and push. So that's a cycle of twisting and untwisting that all those little bones in your feet are supposed to go through. 90% of us are very poor at pronation and supination, or very poor at one or the other. So especially if you've noticed that your feet are very flat-footed, then you're awesome at pronation, but maybe not so good at supination, or maybe at controlling the passage towards pronation. You're sort of always stuck in the bottom. If your feet are very high arched, then you may not have that ability to pronate and absorb shock. So you need to have both going through your feet and your whole legs in the gait cycle. And if you don't have that, your tissues of your feet are gonna get stressed out because that's part of how you deal with shock and part of how you push yourself forward. So I have some pronation and supination work in my Free Your Feet program. That would be a great starting point for you to check that out. Um, and I will be posting a pronation supination exercise on my YouTube for you to check out at some point if you think that might be you. So that's important, pronation supination. It's actually a really important movement for your hips and pelvic floor as well. So um, worth considering. Okay, I just had to turn my piece of paper over. Number five, this was, oh, sorry, six. This is why I had plantar fasciitis. This is what I gave myself. So I got a standing desk at work back when I used to stand like this. And can you see here how I'm kind of ski jumping my hips forward? When you stand like this, what you're doing is you're pushing the weight of your body forward. That puts a ton of pressure on the forefoot. And the forefoot isn't supposed to hold your body weight, really. Your body weight's supposed to be in your heels, and that means your pelvis has to be kind of back vertically over your heels. I call that hip over heel standing. That's hip forward, that's hips back. This looks like it should be really easy to change. It's actually a long-term project for most of us because if you're a hips forward person, your body is used to this pattern and habit. And that usually means you've got long, weak hip flexors and short, tight hamstrings, and you've got to work on balancing out those muscles and giving your body access to new patterns easily in order to change it. But this, this is what changed the game for me was once I started getting good at hips over heels. So I have um, my key favorite exercise for you in that uh, for your feet program. I also have a plantar fasciitis playlist on YouTube that will help you out with that. So uh, lots of resources for you there. Super important uh, piece of the puzzle for, for many of us. Next, let's talk about mobility. So when we walk, as we step forward, the leg that's behind us has to do some stuff. It has to extend back at the hip, lengthen through the ankle, push off through the big toe. That's ideal for all kinds of reasons. It's great for your pelvic floor, it's great for your low back, it's great for all kinds of things, but it's also really great for your feet. If you are lacking toe mobility, so if your big toes can't bend to at least 45 to 60 degrees, then you're not going to be able to get that full extension expression, and you could find yourself in this kind of walking gait that's really a lot of throwing forward. A lot of throwing forward means a lot of catching yourself on your feet, and that means overload. So hip extension and big toe extension and ankle 
dorsiflexion, the ability to bend at your ankles, super important, um, which is another of those reasons why you're going to see tight calves and tight hamstrings go along with plantar fasciitis a lot of the time because here we're in this area where extension goes along with tight calf, or sorry, lack of extension goes along with tight calves, tight hamstrings, um, standing forward. It's all sort of pieces of the same puzzle. So you want to make sure you've got extension mobility. Okay, so here we are on number eight, back line length and strength. So we want to have some length through our calves, through our hamstrings, even through the upper part of our back line, because when our back line is tight, and I'm talking about connective tissue that goes from the nape of our neck down to our toes, when that's tight, that's always pulling on the feet. So that could for sure be part of what's going on in plantar fasciitis. So that's why you're going to see calf stretching and hamstring stretching prescribed so much of the time. I always recommend considering stretching and strengthening at the same time. And that's mostly because it's a more well-rounded way of thinking about our bodies, it's often more effective also. Because if we want to get length in tissues, often the best way to do that is to tell our bodies we want to use those tissues when they're long. So let me show you a quick exercise. This simple hinge here is very strengthening for the hamstrings. Right now my hamstrings, which are the muscles of the backs of my legs, are long but they're holding the weight of my upper body. So I'm asking them to work as I stretch them. So it's not just a pulling on the muscles, it's pulling on the muscles and asking them to work at the same time. So that's a great way to start addressing plantar fasciitis is with eccentric lengthening and strengthening work for your back line. Again, I share lots of it in my programs. You may also want to think about some manual work for your fascia, so that could be rolling on, I don't love ice bottles to be honest, I'd rather roll on balls, um, rolling on foam rollers, that kind of stuff. Rolling can be helpful in getting your nervous system to let go for a little bit. But for most people, it's not the most effective use of their precious exercise time. So I wouldn't spend a ton of time rolling. Do it a little bit if it helps you. Roll your feet maybe because especially if you've got very high stiff arches, getting some mobility and softness into your feet is probably going to be really helpful for you. But I would not recommend that rolling is your only thing to add length and strength. I definitely think you want to think active. So do some rolling if you want to. Do some stretching if you want to, but for sure add the strengthening. And that's where you're going to see things like um, calf raises or calf lowering up and down off stairs, often really useful for plantar fasciitis, again, because you're lengthening those tissues so effectively. That's another reason, by the way, for getting out of conventional shoes, because if you're in conventional shoes with a heel, then your back line never has a chance to um, get long because you're always shortening it. And again, sitting in chairs, actually, I didn't talk about that yet, but sitting in chairs also will do that to you because you're always short when you're sitting in chairs. So if you spend a ton of time sitting, that could also be a part of your backline puzzle. And maybe you want to see some of my videos about sitting on the floor instead of in chairs. Okay, number nine, and this is one a lot of people don't think about and can be totally game changing, is if you have a lot of tension on the top of your foot, it can be kind of pulling your toes up all of the time. That means the tissues on your on your foot are too tight on the top, too long on the bottom, that can be really stressful for the plantar fascia. That can be that overload. So that happens because of footwear that has a raised toe. Very common, you'll see it a lot in athletic footwear uh, where there's a thick sole. That's what lets you not uh, trip and fall over when you're wearing it. But in the long run, especially if there's been a raised heel, it's almost like you've been putting your foot in this kind of banana shaped cradle for however many years. That creates this overly long bottom of the foot stuff, overly short and tight top of the foot stuff, and that can show up as plantar fasciitis. So getting the tissues on the top and the bottom of your foot to be more rebalanced can be really, really important. I have my favorite stretches for that in my Free Your Feet program, so definitely check it out. Okay, so Number 10, the final piece, is to start thinking a little bit about your whole body movement patterns and especially the patterns that show up in your walking. So it's very common for us to have asymmetrical walking patterns. 
Sometimes those asymmetrical walking patterns can show up as an overload in whichever foot is working harder as a result of those patterns. So for example, uh, when I take a step forward with my left foot, my right pelvis likes to twist back. When I take a step forward with my right foot, my pelvis is pretty straight forward. So there's an obvious asymmetry happening in my pelvis as I walk, and you can actually see that if you see videos of me walking. Does that mean I'm gonna get plantar fasciitis? No, of course not. But if you have plantar fasciitis and you can't figure out what's going on, could it be contributing to that? For sure, 100%. So these asymmetrical patterning, um, it's not that there's a problem with them, but sometimes they're gonna be your way forward. And usually the key to that is to kind of get used to doing the opposite pattern. So for me, I might wanna practice twisting my pelvis more to the left or practice keeping my pelvis straighter when I step forward with my left. And that's just a, an example to show you what I might be thinking about with patterning. So if none of those other nine things are resonating for you, or if you've tried them all and you can't get to the bottom of what's going on for you, it very very well might be some asymmetrical upper body stuff that you might want to look into. So there you go. That's 10 tips that you might not have thought about before with plantar fasciitis. Hopefully that gives you at least a bit of a path forward. And what I would recommend is thinking about all these 10 things, figuring out which resonates for you. You know, do you have a lot of tightness at the top of your foot? Does your pelvis really sit forward? Work on the things that really jump out at you and see how things go. Stick with it, give yourself time, do the exercises, pick up my Free Your Feet program for sure, hit me up with questions if you can't figure out exactly what's going on for you, and hopefully that'll start to give you a really awesome path forward to heal naturally. Okay, thanks for joining me.